The topic of this demonstration is thermochemistry. But in addition to talking about the thermochemistry that's going on, we want to talk a little bit about discrepant events. One of the things, when students walk into your classroom, they have certain misconceptions about the world around them. And I believe it's our job as teachers to help them work through those misconceptions so that they can have a right way of thinking about the physical world around them. And one of the things that we want to do with that is try to get them to think a little bit differently, to change their mindsets, to make sure that they go beyond just what they're seeing and have an understanding of what they're seeing. So we're going to use two relatively simple reactions here to get them thinking about what misconceptions they have, how to go about the process of changing those misconceptions so that we can then get down to the basis of the chemistry part of this. Okay, we're going to use an exothermic reaction and an endothermic reaction in order to illustrate the idea of this discrepant event. The first reaction that we're going to do is one that kids have been doing in elementary and middle schools and high schools for years. We're just going to have a little bit of baking soda in the bottom of a flask and we're going to add vinegar to it, the old volcano for some of the kids that are out there. And it's going to make carbon dioxide gas, going to froth all over the place. And so we have the students making observations. I'm just going to take the vinegar and put it in, a few squirts onto the baking soda in the flask. And the students are watching, making observations. They've seen it quite a few times, we hope, by the time they get to high school or middle school. Now I see a lot of frothing. I see gas being released. And we could keep doing that for a while. And what we have them do then, since we're in the thermochemistry part, is we want to look at that and say, okay, I see bubbling, I see frothing. Is that container releasing heat energy or absorbing heat energy? Is that an exothermic reaction or an endothermic reaction? And we wouldn't give them any answers yet. Then we would pair that up with the next reaction. And I've got a saturated solution of sodium acetate. And in the handouts, it will give you the instructions for how to make the supersaturated sodium acetate. And you have to do it carefully and make sure that you let it cool down relatively slowly so that it doesn't go back to crystal form. Now I'm going to attempt to pour this sodium acetate into this flask. Occasionally when I do that, normally I would make it in the flask and then I could just leave it sit. As I pour this though, it may go to a solid state. So we'll see if that goes. And that's the desirable result right there, is that we still have a supersaturated solution of sodium acetate. It hasn't gone back to its solid form yet. So in order to get it to go to its solid form, I'm going to need a solid piece of sodium acetate. The analogy I use for this is the ions are distributed perfectly throughout the solution, a water molecule. So I ask the students, I say, can you hold an egg in your hand? Sure, I can hold an egg in my hand. Can you hold a dozen egg in your hand? No, I don't know. Well, if they're in a carton, yes, you can. And if I perfectly, and we're, we live in this world in our classroom where we can do anything in our minds, if I take a three-quarter inch piece of plywood, cut it in a square, and I perfectly stacked a hundred eggs in a pyramid, could I hold them? Sure you could, okay? So I have them there in a pyramid. You visualizing that? And then smart Alec Jimmy from the back of the room comes in and tosses me an egg, and I try to catch it. What's going to happen to all those eggs? They're going to fall on the floor, and they're going to precipitate out all over. Then i got a mess. Okay? What I have in there right now is I've got all my eggs stacked perfectly throughout the whole solution because I heated it up, and I let it cool, and they distributed themselves out. Well, smart Alec Jimmy's going to come along. And we're going to take a seed crystal, a white piece of sodium acetate, and we're going to drop it in there. And we're going to watch that solidify right before their eyes. And this is where the thinking part starts. They have used their prior knowledge coming into your classroom. They know they've seen things boil before. And normally what they're going to tell you is when they've seen things boil and froth, it's releasing, or it's hot. It is hot to the touch. And when things get solid and turn white, if I were to touch them, they're going to feel cold. And so they have that prior knowledge coming into your classroom. Well, that's just been a qualitative 
description of what's going on right now. We haven't even talked. I haven't even let you know yet whether those are releasing heat or absorbing heat. So now what we want to do is take it from a qualitative type of demonstration and we're going to make it a quantitative type demonstration. So we'll move over here to our uh, temperature probe. And the temperature probes I use in my classroom are the LabQuest. Uh, they're made by Vernier Company um, that Flynn sells these. And what we can do is we can use the temperature probe and you can have a nice display on there of temperatures as we do our reaction. This is the stainless steel temperature probe. I like these because when you give them to, to kids working in a laboratory, they can stir with them, bang them up a little bit. You know, not too rough, but they're pretty durable and they'll last quite a long time. Um, and, and it's very, very nice. And we'll talk a little bit about technology as we go through this today. What I want on the front here is a graph. And I believe the graph is up there. And I'm going to start taking some temperatures by pressing the start button and this is going to take two temperatures every second for me and let's make sure we get that started on there and sometimes the as in a computer it will go to sleep so you wake it back up and it begins to go hopefully not like your students okay we'll take the vinegar we'll put the temperature probe in the vinegar and that's going to give us an initial temperature of that vinegar. And if I wanted to, I could switch over and I could check that temperature initially. So that vinegar is at about 23.9 degrees Celsius. I'm going to switch back to my graphs now. It's taking data for me right there. I'm going to take my temperature probe and I'm going to put it down in my baking soda. And I'm going to slowly pour the vinegar into that and we'll see what happens to that graph as we add the vinegar to it. Are we seeing some data be collected there? And surprisingly to the students, that temperature starts to drop. Now if you think about the prior knowledge they come into your classroom with, when they've seen things that have fizzed and bubbled and they felt it, it's going to feel hot. Not in this case. In this case the reaction is absorbing energy. It's an endothermic reaction. We call that a discrepant event. It, the thinking behind it goes beyond what they think they're seeing. Okay. Now, I could use that same temperature probe. I could just rinse it off. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop my temperature probe right now. And we can see a nice close-up of the graph there. I'm actually going to remove this temperature. I'm going to stop it. I'm going to rerun it. I'm going to take my temperature probe out. And I've got another temperature probe that I could use. With these lab quests, I could have two temperature probes working at one time, and it's up to you what you want to do in your classroom. I could show both reactions at the same time and have the graphs both graphing on the same axes there. But I'm going to plug this in. It's a quick plug and play. I'm going to start a new reaction. I don't need to save that for right now, so I'm going to discard it. And that's the meter that comes up. And I'm not going to get an initial temperature of this. We'll see that as the reaction goes on the next one. This is my supersaturated solution of sodium acetate. I want to shift over to my graph. And the reason that I don't want to take an initial temperature of that is sometimes just by poking the probe into the solution, the reaction will settle out of solution. And I don't want that to happen right now. What I'm going to do is to take a little bit of water and wet the end of my probe. And then I'm going to get a little bit of crystal on the sodium acetate. And you can do a little magic with this yourself. If you have a little crystal between your fingers, you can snap your fingers over it as if you're doing magic and not, not let the kids see the crystal. But we're going to put the crystal right there on the end of the probe. 
Take this off. And I want to start, I want to start my graph for taking temperatures. And we'll let it just start there quick, rather quickly. And then I'm going to take that seed crystal into our supersaturated sodium acetate. And the kids just love watching those crystals grow on the top of that. And you can tell about the nature of your saturated solution. You saw how quickly the one went before as we put the seed crystal in. Sometimes when you make them also, they might still be a little warm as they go. And what's happening to the temperature on that? You can see that it's increasing. Again, a discrepant event. When they've seen things turn solid before and they felt them, it's felt cold to them because they're thinking about ice. It looks like ice. And so we have to go beyond what they see. We have to change a little bit of the misconceptions. And we have to say, okay, that's exothermic. A nice practical application of this is they sell hand warmers in sporting goods stores. And what you can do is it has a little bitty disc in it. It's a pouch that has a supersaturated solution, sodium acetate. You can boil it in water and, it go, and let it cool, and it goes to, uh, stays in aqueous solution. And it's got a little metal disc in there that you can pop, it, snap it back and forth. And that disturbance of the crystal structures makes that heat pack turn solid, and that will stay for quite some time. With the, and it's reusable, and you can use that over and over again. What we want to do is we want to take a look at the energy diagrams for an exothermic and endothermic uh, reaction over here. And what we need to get across to our students is a reaction moves from reactants to products. As it moves from reactants, we have to have the, activate, the activation energy, get over the curve, move to products. If the products end up with more energy than the reactants, that's an endothermic reaction. We're putting energy into that. The delta H is positive. If, however, the products end up with less energy, if the products end up with less energy, overall less potential chemical energy than the reactants, delta H is negative, that's an exothermic reaction. Endothermic reactions feel cold to you, exothermic reactions will feel warm to the touch or with the temperature probe. In any chemical reaction, energy has to be put in to start breaking bonds, and energy comes out as bonds are formed. Sometimes students have a misconception coming in that as you break a bond, energy is released. That's a very common misconception that students are coming into chemistry classes with, and we have to make sure of that. I have my students do this. I have them say, please clap. Okay? If you could do that for me right now, everybody just clap. Okay? And again, and really, really rapidly now. Thank you. Okay. All right. they, they like that. Okay. As an atoms come together and a bond is formed, that energy is released. Okay? It's released because those two atoms that are here are now together. They move to a lower state of energy. If I want to break this stick, I have to put energy into it. Okay? Energy doesn't, I have to put energy into that stick in order to have it broken. And that's how we break bonds, by putting energy into it. And so it's the net flow of putting energy in to break bonds, energy being released when bonds are formed, that's how we know whether it's a positive delta H for endothermic or a negative delta H for exothermic. Try this in your classroom. Have the students go beyond what their prior knowledge is, build on their prior knowledge, use it to tag to so they can make links and connections, and then use the discrepant events to take them through the process of changing their misconceptions. Thank you.